Alright, Russell Dolag here once again with the fourth branch, bringing you another interview with someone you want to know, asking relevant questions to our islands, and also questions asked by you, the viewers. Today we're here at the FSM Consulate Office. I'm here with Acting FSM Consul General Henry Shrew. Thanks again for meeting with us. It really means a lot. Um, we got quite a few questions to go through, and hope you can bear with us for a little bit. Um, one thing we like to do is we just like to give our interviewees a chance to introduce themselves and give a little bit of information that they want. So why don't you try to do that? Okay, um, thank you for your time, and I didn't get your name. Oh, I'm Russell Dolan. Russell. Okay. Russell, I'm Henry Shu, as you just mentioned. Um, I graduated from UAG Law back in 1998, returned to Kusha and started working there at the Kusha State Government. For about six and a half years, and I moved to the national government back in 2007. Um, just the beginning of this administration, work at the Department of Foreign Affairs as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for European Affairs. Then later on, this uh, position as a Foreign Service Officer was opened in 2009. So I applied and got hired. So posted year 2009, February of 2009. So this is about almost two years for me to work here at the uh, Everson Consulate Office here in Honolulu. At this time, I am uh, carrying the duty as the Acting Consul General for this office. Um, how did you get appointed to become the Acting Consul General? Well, basically the Consul General was um, uh, relocated. He was nominated to be the first ambassador to our embassy in People's Republic of China in Beijing so he was confirmed and he decided to move on so he left and I was the second person in the office that could keep this position as the acting consul general so that's how I got this position um, is there gonna be another person appointed or do you think it, when, when, when will a, how long till an official consul general will be appointed it just depends on the process. Uh, being a consul general here is, uh, uh, this position is advice and consent. The president should uh, should nominate someone to do this duty and send it to the our Congress, FSM Congress. So the Congress should act on it. If they confirm that person, then that person will come in as the consul general. So it really depends on the process. It really depends on uh, how president will, or this administration will look into it. As you all know, this um, um, this March will be a general election for the national government. So I guess that's the purpose that they delay not doing any action to bring in somebody because the, as you know, advising consent position is just based on the, administra the current administration. So obviously next January, I mean July, as the new year for the, I mean, sorry, next May, as the new uh, new month or time for the new administration will come out, that's when they're going to select a new leadership. Mm -hmm. So obviously that person will do uh, uh, appoint his consul general. You know. So they don't want to make it an official one because a new administration is coming through. They don't want to make it because they might change. Or... I guess that's what is really going on because you know the cost is not easy. Eh? Bringing somebody here, it's very costly with the traveling and with the housing, with the paper processing is also mm. a lot of work. Okay, thank you. Um, we're here with you, the face of the council, but uh, we also want to know who else is on your staff and what are their titles? At this time, uh, according to our budget for this office, there should be four. Four officials or four personnel should be serving this office as uh, FSM consulate office, general office. Yeah. And at this uh, moment in time, it's run by an acting, myself, and we also have a foreign service officer here, Robin Fritz, and the third person, there are only three of us. The third person is Angie Simon, as the administrative administrator for the office. So she's taking care of our financial means, our office operations, and of course, uh, uh, so working with, along with us to run this office. Okay, what are your roles and duties and your other co-workers' roles and duties as a consul, as the consulate? 
Well, as you can see, uh, being the acting council chair, I operate that office. We have to, uh, everything that goes out from this office should be managed and uh, uh, signed by the acting or the aid. And being a foreign service officer, you're here to serve the country, serve our leaders, serve the citizens here in any capacity, any uh, council work that we have to serve our the people. And of course, um, work with the host state, which is the Hawaii. And sometimes, I mean, and coincide with the whole country of the U.S. to work with our embassy in D.C., uh, dealing with the government to government things or doing counseling work to our citizens out in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And the administrator is just running with us, with the assistance, and also office, as I mentioned earlier. You mentioned the embassy in the U.S., and one of the questions you got was what's the difference between an embassy and a consulate office? Well, yeah, both of us are uh, at the embassy level. They're really working directly with the uh, host country. They're working with the government. For instance, our embassy in Washington, D.C., they're, they're, they're there for us, for the U.S. federal government and the U.S. Uh, US federal government, uh, for sure, and then possibly with the 50 states government of the U.S., uh, relating with the, or keeping our close ties with our diplomatic relations and um, uh, straighten our relationship, in fact, on, and eyes and ears of our leaders back in the country to everything that needed to be feedback or have from our country for Everson government to relate to the U.S. government. And at the uh, consulate level, as you can see, we are providing consular, general consular services to our citizens here in the U.S. and with the government of the host country, with the specific limits instead of Hawaii. Yeah, we all know that one of the main things we come here for the consulate is for making passports, right? So this question has to be asked. What are the procedures for renewing passports? Okay, every day we deal that we deal with passport issue. You're right. Whether to follow up on a, a status of a citizen's passport or to help assist in issuing a new passport or any information regarding passport. So that's one of the uh, major or one of the role that we really take up in this office. Uh, one procedure or, or how to obtain a passport is, of course, you apply it, have it notarized, and at this time here in the here in Hawaii, we don't we don't um, get the application and mail it for the citizens. If we know somebody's coming in as an official and returning from Hawaii. We can help getting the application and ask the person if they can help us and get it back to Bon Bay or back to Chuk or back to Koshai or back to Yeah. But uh, uh, to get back to the question is, we uh, help the citizens in filling up the form, notarizing it, which is free, and then give them the instructions of what is needed. A person need an if you still have your passport and you want it renew, you need your you need to fill up a passport application have it notarized, sign in the rectangular box in the, in the center or not to touch the line or go over the line, and have your passport ready to be returned or surrender, old passport I mean. Mm. Old passport, uh, passport application, two photo passport, and um, money order of $50. And if you are those people that are unfortunate, lost your passport, you need to apply for a form, which we call an affidavit of loss, stolen or damaged passport. You need to have two forms at that time, application passport and an affidavit form. And of course, again, with two photo passport size and a money order of $75. There's difference with that. If you lost your passport, you will pay $75. If you still have your passport and surrender it, you will have to pay $50. Some people still have their passport and they said, okay, I still have it, I'm just gonna send $50. Immigration won't process your application until you surrender the passport. They wanna see if it's in, still there. So that's one way to uh, uh, apply. I mean, that's the way that we assisted for um, issuing a passport, a uh, person passport. Um, one of the questions having to do with passports comes from some parents, a lot of Micronesians are coming into the U.S. having children. They're granted dual citizenship. Um, some of these parents want to make it that they only have 
a single a single passport. Is there a special procedure to follow with that? Or? Okay, as of now, uh, we really don't have that term, dual citizenship for our country. That's one of the things that will be in place or in the ballot for the uh, congressional election in March 7 overseas. In the country, in back in Everson, they will have it in March 8. Um, one of the issue in our, uh, one of the amendments that our leaders, Everson leaders will change or try to ask the citizens to vote on is the amendment of dual citizenship. If we are saying yes on that, and it passed 75% of the uh, people in cast vote, then that uh, issue of amending the dual citizenship in our constitution will be amended. So we can do that. We can have dual citizenship. At this time, I, I believe your question is, does she was born, this, all the she was mm. born, uh, when does the single out their citizenship? Is that it? If that's so, then... Uh, if you have a kid, a U.S. born uh, child, that child will be carrying citizens of U.S. and FSM until that person or that kid reach age, age of 18, and he or she will have two years to um, think of whether that person will be FSM or U.S. citizens as of age 21. So when you reach age 21, you will be, you must uh, co co you must decide whether you'll be U.S. citizens or FSM citizens. But if we pass these two citizenship, that person can remain U.S. or FSM citizens forever. Mm. So what age will that uh, fall into? Like, is it just people that have been born? Uh, U.S. born, yeah. yeah. But like, if they're 18 right now and they pass it? If they, they're 18 and they pass it, that's something that will, it will be looked into. Okay. I believe that person can go back and regain or revisit his citizenship because he's, he or she was born in the U.S. I'm sure there will be some room to uh, uh, arrange, but as of now, we are not really, I, I'm not really uh, uh, have knowledge of what's going to happen if two, citizens, two citizenship is granted to our citizenship. Another question coming from one of our viewers of uh, they want to know if there's any legislation at the national or state levels that would keep ex-convicts from leaving the FSM or their own state to go to the other states. Well, if, if you if you're committing something, you must or a crime or whatever that break our law, you must serve that thing. And there's a duration of probation probationary for you not to travel or go out. And yes, there there is there is at the sub, uh, FSM supreme level. And I know it all. I mean, I, I kind of have that all the four uh, four states court level also protect them because it's the safety of our people there, and it's the safety of uh, the other nation, other country that that person will be visiting. If, if we are to let's look into this um, uh, diplomatically, if they happen to give out or allow these people to go out, let's say coming to Hawaii. What happens if the U.S. allow their convicts to travel up to our place too? We're going to be really in trouble. So I believe that's the way that, uh, that's why we're trying, that's the way that we should be protected, or which is already there. There's protection of our convicts not to travel out. Oh, that's, that's really good information. <laughs>